Hello everybody, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video, which today is going to be looking at commercial flight paths. Many flat earthers have stated that plane routes make more sense on a flat earth rather than a globe, and I've actually found some useful tools in Photoshop that should hopefully settle this argument. For example, just the other day somebody commented on one of my other videos that flight paths on a globe don't make any sense, and they linked a video by Flat Out Truth, saying apparently that would shoot any globe argument down in flames. So let's take a look. Now let's check out a flight from New York to Moscow, Russia. Okay, now if you look up the flight pattern on Google Maps, it will show you a route leaving New York, going through the tip of Canada, then through the tip of Greenland, then through the tip of Iceland, through Sweden, and then into Moscow. I mean, anybody with common sense knows that the fastest route between A and B is in a straight line, as we see here. I mean, you do not have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. It's common sense from point A to point B is a straight line that will always be the fastest and shortest route. Now, check out what you have to pass to get from New York to Moscow on a flat earth map, a straight line. Check this out. The edge of Canada, the edge of Greenland, straight over Iceland, straight over Sweden, and into Moscow. Huh, imagine that. There you go. Now, there is a slight oversight here in Flat Out Truth's video, which is that he's comparing flight paths of a flat Earth, but not to a globe. He's comparing them to a Mercator map, which is also flat and heavily distorted. Now, he's correct that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, and that would make the most sense for a flight, but he's drawing a straight line across a Mercator map. Now, one of the tools in Photoshop that I found actually lets me take a Mercator map and project it as a sphere. So, for example, here is the sun moon map from timeanddate.com. If I bring this into Photoshop and I go up along the top and select 3D, then come down to new mesh from layer and mesh preset, it gives me a bunch of different shapes that I can pick. If I pick any of these, it will transform that photo into a 3D shape. For example, I can see what the Earth would look like if it were shaped like a hat. And it allows me to rotate it around in any direction as well. We could even see what the Earth would look like if it were a wine bottle, just for any alcoholics around. But the one we're interested in is Sphere, which basically gives us a globe. So we can see how that with the sun sitting on the coast of South America, twilight starts exactly halfway round, just as we would expect on a globe. Although, please ignore the shadow that's across South America. That's one that Photoshop is adding in as part of the 3D render, and whenever I try and turn that shadow cast off, the program crashes. But it's obvious that the shadow isn't part of the original image, so we can ignore it. So, if I take a Mercator projection, and I draw a straight line in in green, going directly between New York and Moscow, like Flat Out Truth suggests, and I then add a route that the flight actually takes, and I'll put that as a red line. This goes just south of Greenland, Iceland, and across Scandinavia. But if I then switch the map to a globe projection, we can see that now the red line does in fact form a straight path across the globe, with the green line now becoming a longer route. Funnily enough, at the beginning of the year, I went to New York, and during the flight back to Heathrow, I brought up the flight route on the plane's entertainment system, which showed the route that was being taken around the globe and how it forms a straight flight path. But another argument that flat earthers bring up is southern hemisphere flights. A few years ago, there was a very popular claim going around that no flights stayed within the Southern Hemisphere. They always include a stopover in a location in the Northern Hemisphere, which they say on a globe makes no sense, but on a flat Earth, it winds up forming a pretty straight line. I did actually cover Southern Hemisphere flights in one of my very early videos, showing there are flights you can get that take you from Australia to South Africa to South America and back to Australia without ever crossing the equator. Recently, uh, Pastor Will Duffy was on Jeronism's channel, and he was bringing up Southern Hemisphere flights to Jeron and Austin Witsit as evidence against Flat Earth. And he brought up a few good points, and Austin and Jeron tried to counter them. A very good example Will brought up was flights across Australia. So I'm going to show you here. Here is a flight 
uh, from Perth to Brisbane. And if we look at what we believe, what, what the globe people believe is the shape of Australia, we, we should know that the width is just slightly wider than the max height from top to bottom. And so this flight right here was four hours and three minutes from Perth to Brisbane. And then here's a flight. Okay. Here's a flight from Melbourne to Darwin. And it's three hours and 55 minutes. The flights going between the coasts north and south across Australia take pretty much the same amount of time as the flights going between the coasts east and west. And surely that means that the distances north to south are about the same as east to west. But on a flat earth, Australia is shown on their map as being about two and a half times wider than it is tall. Now, Jaren and Austin's main rebuttal to this seem to be that the flight times are dependent on the speed of the plane, and planes don't always fly at the exact same speed. Uh, flights are consistently different times. There is no like specific exact time for flights. And the way that these programs get the supposed speeds that the planes go is they um, assume the distance, and then they look at the time. You're saying that, oh, it's not always eight minutes. I, like. I could literally just Google it right now and I'll find one that is not the same times as these. Do you know that okay. computers basically will decide where the planes will fly? Or do you think it's pilots steering the wheel of the plane? No, computers do almost everything. Okay, so imagine that I've got a little two toy cars and I'm starting in New York and I want one to get to San Francisco and one to get to Colorado. Could I program them so that the one gets to Colorado after the one gets to San Francisco? Is that possible? Um. If you change the vary the speeds. Right. So by varying the speeds of planes, you could easily get them where you want them to be at a certain time. Jaron even highlighting that often when planes are late taking off, they say they'll try and make up the time. Now tell me, do you have you ever flown and left late from your flight? You guys are getting yeah. on, it's about thirty minutes late, forty minutes late. Do you get where you're going on time? Sometimes. Yeah. So you know why that is? It's because planes can get up to different levels and get to Places the computer will make sure they get there on time, even if the plane leaves 40 minutes late. I think he's perhaps suggesting that pilots are basically instructed to fly at a particular speed that would correlate to what we would expect on a globe. Except that isn't really possible. Now, some of it comes down to economics. Airlines will do things in the most cost-effective manner that they can get away with. Even short-haul flights, the planes will climb to pretty high cruising altitudes, for example, Ryanair run regular flights between Liverpool to Dublin, which is 140 miles as the crow flies. And yet, the plane still climbs to 22,000 feet. It's no sooner got up there that it starts descending again, but the pilots do that because it's more fuel efficient than flying through the thicker air low down. And the flights across Australia will reach the far side of 30,000 feet because their flights are much longer than that. Now, interestingly, if you actually read up on this, pilots point out that whilst they tell passengers they'll try and make up the time if they're delayed, there isn't actually a busting lot they can really do. Flying faster might shave a few minutes off, but they don't do that because of the increased fuel usage, unless there are other factors such as connecting flights that many of their passengers need to catch, in which case it could cost the airline more in compensation than paying for the extra fuel. They can sometimes ask for a more direct route if their original plan was maybe trying to miss some congested airspace or bad weather, or if they're landing at a busy airport, maybe they can request to be bumped up the landing queue to save a few minutes, but in reality, most of the time, planes can't actually recoup that much of the lost time from delays. I've had a few times where I've been sat at the gate, looking out of the window, at the exact time that I'm scheduled to be taking off, and the inbound flight hasn't even arrived yet. In fact, I've just pulled up Flight Tracker and looked at the flights for yesterday, and one of the first planes that I found flying across the Atlantic is this British Airways flight from London to Los Angeles, which was very late taking off. The average flight time for London to Los Angeles is down as 10 hours 37 minutes, and it managed to do it in 10 hours 13. So on a 10 hour flight, they managed to shave off 30 minutes. But if you look at that route for the flights going between LA and London, it's not the same plane every single time. It keeps swapping and changing. 
if we look at that one particular aircraft that's currently delayed, aircraft GXLEB, you can see it's gone to many different places. All its recent flights are all several hours behind schedule. So clearly it had a major delay somewhere, but it's not been able to recoup that time back over the last half dozen flights or so. But the bigger problem with Jaren's argument is, well, the limits of the planes. A plane needs lift in order to stay in the air. Lift is generated from the air and the wings. As the plane gets higher up, the air becomes thinner, meaning there is less lift. So a plane has to then fly faster to increase the amount of air hitting the wings to offset that difference. If a plane is flying too slow that the amount of lift it generates isn't enough to overcome the weight of the plane, they hit what is called a stall and the plane will drop. Now, there are many variables to stall speeds, including the type of aircraft, so there's no one specific figure available for a stall speed. However, from reading around online, it looks like the average sort of stall speed for planes at 35,000 feet is about 250 knots airspeed. Now, airspeed is different to ground speed in that it's the speed of the air moving past the aircraft, not necessarily the speed with which the plane is moving above the ground. Since if a plane is flying into a headwind, the air will be hitting the plane faster than the plane is moving along the ground. Conversely, if they're flying with a tailwind, the air will be hitting the plane slower. So if there were no wind, the airspeed and ground speed would be equal, and the plane would need to be flying above 250 knots, which is 463 kilometers or 287 miles per hour, in order to maintain a steady cruising altitude. That would be the slowest that the plane could fly at. So that would have to be the north to south route, meaning the east to west flight would have to be two and a half times faster in order to keep a similar flight time. Two and a half times faster is 625 knots, or 1,157 kilometers, or 719 miles per hour. That is very close to the speed of sound, and that would be the ground speed, meaning if the plane were flying into a strong headwind, its airspeed could exceed the speed of sound, and planes can't do that. In fact, the maximum speed of the Airbus A321 is 876 kilometers per hour, which happens to be the model of plane that was flying that east to west route when I had a look at it. So it's just not physically possible, based on a flat earth version of Australia, for planes flying east to west to regularly consistently have ground speeds two and a half times faster than the planes flying north to south. Either one would be exceeding its physical limitations or one wouldn't be flying fast enough. Incidentally, there is another way though to verify the proportions for Australia that would be to drive it. You can drive from Perth to Sydney along the south coast, which is near enough the full width of Oz, and it shows a travel distance of 3,932 kilometers. You can drive from Adelaide to Darwin, which is most of the north to south, and that's 3,030 kilometers. And that points more to the globe scale for the country rather than the flat earth map. One point Austin brought up though was saying that whilst he accepts there are flights that stay within the southern hemisphere, they're very few and far between compared to the total number of flights. I would say the more accurate thing is that people were talking about why are there not that many southern flights ah. direct because there are way shorter paths that go straight there and the vast majority of them go out of their way up north. And people just say stuff like, oh, it had to stop for fuel. No, it, did, it no. needs more fuel to go up there. And that is a fact, that the vast majority of flights uh, are not southern to southern. These are This is a very rare flight. As in, out of all of the flights, it's basically an anomaly. Not saying it's fake. I'm saying that's a fact. And that flights from the south, they go up north out of their way many times. And there yeah. are many times we can show that the path makes more sense on a plane Earth than a globe Earth and would cost extra money. But this again comes down to economics. Only about 12% of the world's population live in the Southern Hemisphere. Only 32% of Earth's land mass is in the Southern Hemisphere, so statistically there are far more people wanting to fly to and from places in the Northern Hemisphere than stay solely in the South. And 80% of the surface of the Southern Hemisphere is ocean, so flying between the continents in the Southern Hemisphere involves going over vast oceans with nowhere to stop which means you need a plane that can fly that distance without refueling. 
And typically in the past, that has meant the only planes with the endurance to fly that far were very large planes like jumbo jets and triple sevens. But those use a lot of fuel to travel those distances for routes with very little demand. So they made no financial sense. The more cost effective way for airlines was to have those relatively few numbers of people fly more popular routes to somewhere in the northern hemisphere and then transfer to a different route to get back to the south. I mean, it's like here in the UK, there are a lot of rural villages around that often only have one bus route that go through them. That route will go to bus stations in nearby towns and cities. But if you want to travel to another rural village, it's pretty common that you have to get a bus into the city and then switch to a different bus on a different route, sometimes going back in mostly the same direction you've just come to get to where you want to go. Because it's just not cost effective for a bus company to run a bus between two rural villages that hardly anyone's going to use. The whole flight situation around the Southern Hemisphere, though, has changed a lot in recent years, with Boeing and Airbus pushing more fuel-efficient planes like the 787 and the A350, which can fly these Southern Hemisphere routes much cheaper than in the past. So, even though they might be few and far between, these flights do exist. Now, let's look at which makes more sense between flights on a globe and flights on flat Earth. I've seen a lot of examples in the past of flat earthers where they'll pull up, say, one particular flight that might have made an unscheduled diversion for some reason to a different airport that is well out of their way, and somehow that proves the Earth is flat. Now, there could be any number of reasons for that. Not all airports can handle all types of planes, so maybe it was a large plane that needed to divert to a suitable airport. Perhaps there was a medical emergency on board and they needed to get close to somewhere with suitable medical facilities. There are multiple reasons other than the Earth is flat. Now, when there are over 100,000 flights happening every single day around the world, you can't really rely on a one-off random event as conclusive proof. Thankfully, though, this is where I think Photoshop can make things a bit clearer for us. Not only does Photoshop have the ability to project Mercator maps as a sphere, but now, as I found out, seemingly, it can reproduce flat Earth maps. By going to Filter, Distort, and Polar Coordinates, then selecting Rectangular to Polar, it will transform a Mercator map to a Gleason map. Or you can do Polar to Rectangular if you want to swap a Gleason back to Mercator. The initial result will be distorted because it's a rectangle projecting as a circle, so you'd then have to stretch the aspect ratio to 1 to 1. You can do that beforehand instead if you want. Squash the rectangle to a square and then do the polar coordinates. You get the same result. But as before, here is the sun moon map from timeanddate.com, and we can see how the Earth would be lit by sunlight if it's flat and where nighttime would fall. And I could do this for intervals of every one hour and produce a time lapse for flat Earth. Now, all commercial flights can be tracked in real time. There's a website called Flight Radar 24, which I've personally used on many occasions. I've tracked flights across the world when my family have been on them. I've used it for spotting planes that I'm photographing to work out how far away they are. Actually, I've used that in another video I've got coming up that you probably won't want to miss. And I've even used it ahead of time to see in advance when planes would be flying over me, and they did. So this tracker is accurate, and you can play back the trackings as well. Not just for individual flights, but you can have every plane across the world visible all at once. So I took a screen recording of the tracker playback that covered a period of a few hours worth of flights all around the world. I put that video into Photoshop and I was able to do the polar coordinates distortion on the video itself and produce this. This shows how the flight paths would look if the Earth is flat. They're all basically going in a huge loop. I particularly like this one rogue plane that showed up right along the ice wall. I think that's one of the flights from Santiago to southern Australia. Maybe they got a bit lost or they were looking for penguins. Unfortunately, though, Photoshop seemingly doesn't allow you to put the 3D sphere render directly onto video footage. It only works with still images. So I took 41 screenshots of various points of the tracker video, rendered every single one of them individually as a sphere projection, and then put them together in this time lapse. 
Now I've left it centered over Africa because that's how Photoshop initially rendered every image and to look at it from a different angle would have meant turning every individual render and trying to point them at exactly the same spot, which would have taken ages. But this I think is plenty enough to demonstrate that even though there might be relatively few flights that stay within the Southern Hemisphere, all the flights that are visible are flying in pretty much straight lines around the globe, but on flat Earth, they're flying in circles. But as Flat Out Truth highlighted at the beginning. I mean, you do not have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. It's common sense. From point A to point B is a straight line that will always be the fastest and shortest route. So surely flights on a globe make more sense than on flat Earth. Well, that's going to be it for this video. As always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons and hopefully... We'll see you in the next video.